Well, welcome. We are so grateful that you're here today. My name is Brandon. I get the privilege of being one of the pastors here on staff. And yes, we are diving back into the Gospel of Matthew. If you're new to redemption, you're like, okay, how do these people teach? What does it look like? Well, sometimes we focus on specific topics. And so over the last three months, we focused on the topic of prayer. We really sense the Lord was wanting to push and challenge us in our prayer life. And so we've been on this journey to be a people of prayer, praying a lot. We also at Redemption alternate, and we just teach through large sections of Scripture. And so back in December of 2022, a year and a half ago, we started the Gospel of Matthew. Here's the thing with the Gospel of Matthew. It's 28 chapters. So we're like 10 and a half chapters in. I don't know. Maybe we get done in the next, I don't know, two years. Maybe we'll be done with the Gospel of Matthew. But here's context about the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew is one of four counts of Jesus' life. If you turn to the New Testament, it is the very first book in the New Testament. And it goes from Jesus' genealogy all the way to his life, death, and resurrection. And so at Redemption, we want to have crystal clear clarity on who Jesus is. If he is the centerpiece of our faith, then we must know who he is. Now to give you context about the passage we just read today. Jesus is really beginning to peak at this point in his ministry in popularity. Jesus has challenged the religious elite of this day. And it says that he is teaching with power and authority. So at this time, he has thousands of people gathering and he's teaching and they are overwhelmed with how powerful his teaching is. They're drawn to him. He's also performed amazing miracles at this point. He has calmed a storm with just his words. He has healed the sick. He has healed the demon possessed. Word is getting out about Jesus. Literally has thousands of people following him. And now he's at such a juncture in his popularity where he's sending out his dearest disciples. So those that are closest to him, he goes, here's what I'm going to do. I'm now going to send you out. And you're going to take the authority I'm entrusting to you to all of these different towns and villages. And so put yourself in the mind of the disciple just for a moment. You've witnessed Jesus do all of these amazing miracles. You've witnessed Jesus teach with authority. You've witnessed Jesus challenge the religious elite of the day. If, if this is you and this is the mindset of the disciple, you're like, all right, giddy up. Jesus, you're about to send us out. You're giving us your power, your authority, and we're going to go out and experience the kingdom. In their mind, in so many ways, this was a really big turning point. They would have thought this, Jesus, it's now time to establish your rule and reign. It's time to overthrow the Roman government. It's time for you to sit on the throne, and we're going to be your main guys around that throne room. We're going to have a position of power and authority alongside of you. Everything that's promised in the Old Testament, you're going to establish now. And so they have all these expectations when Jesus is like, I'm going to send you out. And then we get to this passage. And all of their expectations, maybe even their dreams, are going to be just crushed or turned. Have you ever had a moment where your expectations, you signed up for something and it looked nothing like what you anticipated it. I was thinking back on my, this past week, my first job. My first job was at Publix. I grew up in the 90s. Uh, for you young kids, that was the 1900s. I had my first job. And, and I, actually, let me do this. How many of you have ever worked at Publix? I feel like it's kind of a rite of passage if you grew up in the area. Yeah, okay, lots of people worked at Publix. I was a bag boy. And I had all these dreams when I applied for the job. I'm like, well, now I'm going to be, I'm 16 years old. I'm going to be filthy rich. I make $5 an hour, all right? You know, that 20 hours, that's $100. I knew nothing of taxes. So when I got my first paycheck, and it's like, wait, who's stealing all of this money out of my check? In my mind, I was going to be filthy rich. I had a lot of friends that worked there. So I'm like, man, I'm going to have so much fun. I'm going to make so much money. This is going to be great. That's not what a bag boy at Publix experiences. Not great wealth and great fun. It took me not too terribly long, just a few weeks into this, to realize this is nothing like I signed up for or thought. 
here I am cleaning, you ready for this, a public restroom. Bag boys, I don't know if you knew this, but they have the, the fine duty of cleaning the restrooms at the end of the night. Show of hands, how many of you have ever cleaned a public restroom? Okay, oh, I, I, I only know my private restroom. What are you people doing in the private restroom that you feel the need to act that way in a public restroom? If you've ever cleaned a public restroom, you realize people just lose all sense of direction, <laughs> all sense of cleanliness. I mean, it's unbelievable when you actually have to do that. So I'm in this bathroom, which by the way, ladies, I know I mean, we're all gathered here. Don't be judging the men because I've cleaned a woman's public restroom as well. Okay. There's not a big difference. Okay. Okay. I'm cleaning this restroom, and I'm thinking, what did I sign up for? I'm not filthy rich. I don't want to clean public restrooms. And maybe in your life, you've had a similar instance where you're like, hey, I'm signing up for something, and it was nothing like you anticipated. For the disciples, this is such a moment. They're like, Jesus, we left everything for you. Remember, we left our jobs. We left our homes, our families. We're following you. We thought you were going to usher in the kingdom a physical rule and reign. And here we are. You're sending us out, and you're going to tell us this. This is an unexpected turn for them. Verse 16, he says, behold. This literally means, okay, I want your attention. I want your gaze because I'm about to send you out and it's not going to be like what you expected. You're anticipating this over here, but this is how it's actually going to look. He says, behold, I want your attention and gaze. He says, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now, back in that time frame, this is a, a really important metaphor. Back in that time frame, sheep were the most common animal of that area. You know, like dogs are the most common area or animal in our area. Sheep were like that for a Jew. And the most common predator was what? The wolf. And so you, if you were a shepherd or you had sheep, you were always on the lookout for wolves because wolves always meant danger. So Jesus essentially is like, all right, I'm going to send you out. Now, listen up, listen up, gather closely. You guys, I am sending you into danger. They're like, wait, 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 wait. I thought we were about to rule and reign here. What are you saying? We're, we're the sheep and they're the wolves. We thought maybe it'd be the other way around. He's like, no, no, you're the sheep. I'm sending you into danger. One of the cultural sayings that we have uh, here in the West is, hey, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Try telling that to the disciples right here. They're like, wait, wait, the safest place to be. You just told me that I'm a sheep and I'm about to go in the midst of wolves. Like danger, danger, danger. Yes. Sometimes when we follow the Lord, it brings us into a very dangerous place or dangerous moment. And there's three things he says, this is what you can expect following me. I know you had these expectations, but this is what it really looks like to follow me. The first is my disciples will experience persecution. Verse 23, it says, when they persecute you. So when I send you out, it's not a matter of if they're going to persecute you, but when they persecute you. So you are going to experience this. There's no way around it. There's no shortcut. You're going to experience persecution. Now, it's easy for us to read that and go, okay, I'm glad I was not there listening to Jesus because this is his words to his disciples. Well, there's an expansion of this thought later on in the New Testament. 2 Timothy 3.12 says this. Indeed, all, I looked up the Greek, it means all, all, who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, what will be persecuted? Like every single believer will experience a level of persecution. Now, I know here we sit in the West, and we may not have a good grasp on what it looks like to be persecuted. And so here's what I want to do. I just want to define 
persecution for us. And this definition comes from Open Doors Ministry. Uh, we have a member, Mr. Robert Beckman over here, who is on staff with Open Doors Ministry. Essentially, they are there to serve and support the persecuted church worldwide. They are literally established and set up to provide support to Christians around the world that are facing extreme persecution. This is how they define persecution, so we're all on the same page. It says this, any hostility experienced as a result of proclaiming the name of Jesus, any hostility that people experience, not because of crimes they're committing, but because they simply bear the name Jesus. I like this definition because it's really open-ended. It allows us to see persecution can come in many different forms. Persecution can come in these ways. Rejection, isolation, denying of basic needs like water, food, housing, violent abuse, imprisonment, death. There are Christians around the world experiencing this. And you're like, well, how many Christians are experiencing this? Well, open doors. This is what their stats reveal. Worldwide, there are 365 million Christians who are suffering high levels of persecution. 365 million. That's a million a day. 365 million. One in seven Christians experience persecution. This is worldwide. One in five, though, experience persecution in Africa. Two in five experience persecution in Asia. This year, there's likely to be nearly 5,000 Christians who are put to get death merely because of their faith in Christ. And there is approximately 15,000 properties owned by Christians, churches, that will be under physical attack simply because it bears the name of Christ. I want to show you a map. This is also from Open Doors. So you guys kind of get a picture of this is where the hot spots of persecution are happening. If you see the, the deep red, that is where the most extreme levels of persecution is happening worldwide. In other words, it's very dangerous to be a Christian in these countries. Just a few countries, you have Northern Korea, Somalia, Libya, India, Afghanistan, Iran, just a few countries where it's incredibly dangerous to be a Christian. Now, there's also high levels, the orange area, high levels of persecution. What's really fascinating is you have Egypt, Saudi Arabia, but if you look over just south of us in some parts of Mexico, Christians experience high levels of of persecution. Now, I wanted you to see this because we have dear brothers and sisters throughout the world bear the name Jesus and are experiencing rejection, isolation, de denying of basic essential needs like food, water, clothing, maybe put to death, certainly violence. This is a real thing that's come to pass in the church right here in 2024. Now, here in America, it's a lot more subtle, right? We don't experience the extreme or the high levels, but we certainly, there's some form of persecution that can happen. We can experience rejection from a social perspective, isolation, maybe some mocking. How about this? You try to present your Christian worldview on certain social media platforms. I promise you, People who would not be brave enough to tell you to your face will certainly tell you how idiotic you are online. So we certainly can experience some form of persecution, but in the mind of Jesus, not just to these disciples, but to all Christians, we will experience some level of persecution if we're living in line with the kingdom. He also warns them about this, betrayal. Persecution, persecution, betrayal. This is a really tough one because essentially what we have is the closest relationships will experience some divisiveness, some separation. He says this in verse 21, brother will deliver over to death and the father, his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. This word deliver over, it occurs 119 times in the New Testament. And basically, we translate it one or two ways. 
either deliver over or betrayal, betrayed. So there's this underlying tone here that brother will betray brother. A child will betray parents. Parents will betray children. Why? Well, the Christian faith It rubs a culture wrong. There's an opposition that happens when we live out our faith that is experienced. And even the closest, most intimate relationships, we can experience a level of betrayal. And then finally, he gives them one more warning. You're going to experience persecution, betrayal, and last, hate. Verse 22, and you will be hated. By all for my name's sake. So all these people that are persecuting you, betraying you, there's this underlying motive in their hearts. They despise you. There's a disdain for you. There's a hatred towards you that they're experiencing. And so what you have is whenever the light shines in the darkness, those that want nothing to do with the light are agitated. Those that want nothing to do with a a, a, a a Christian faith will begin to bring opposition to the table. I, I know we live in a culture that's like, hey, you know, all Jesus did was love. But when you really look at the words of Jesus, he's very clear and honest. Certainly he loved. But the message and life that he was ushering in It will bring a level of division and opposition because you have two worldviews and value systems that collide together and they are opposed to one another. Now, I think really what he's getting at and the, the, the precedence that he wants to set with his disciples is this. Following Jesus comes at a cost. And that is not a teaching that's often found in the church in the West. Sometimes it's this teaching. If you follow Jesus, life will get so much better. Circumstances will get so much better. But when you actually look at Jesus, his disciples, the calling of the New Testament, sometimes we follow him and circumstances don't get better. They actually could get worse. There could be families that are divided, hate that is spilled over towards you just because of your faith in Christ, persecution that happens. And so there's certainly, when we look at the scriptures, we see that sometimes our circumstances don't get better as a Christian. We're never promised better circumstances on this earth. But here's what we are promised, a peace that passes understanding, a joy that sustains you and I, even in the midst of suffering and hardship. God will change us. He doesn't always change our circumstances. Another thing I do want to note is whenever you live a Christian life, a kingdom life, you bear the message in name of Jesus. If we're doing it right, there's going to be this. There's going to be an attraction to us and a repulsion experience. Some people are going to be drawn in by our faith. And this happened with Jesus whenever he came on the scene. I mean, there were people that were drawn to him. Who? Sinners, tax collectors. The unlikely, the unexpected begin to be attracted to him, draw near to him. They want to listen more about this this scandalous grace that he speaks of. But then there was also those that were just repulsed by Jesus. The religious elite. So much so that they wanted to betray Jesus wanted him to be persecuted and put to death. So if we're doing it right, I I think there's a balance here that we experience. Tim Keller says it really well. He says this, if Christians are living and speaking as they should, they will be attractive to non-believers and persecuted. If you only see opposition and not many conversions, or if you see popularity and no persecution, you are not living as you should. And so there's both and in the kingdom life. Those that are oddly drawn to us if we live a kingdom life, and those that are repulsed by a kingdom life. Because again, there's this clashing of value systems. 
Now, what Jesus will go on to do, he says, you're going to experience these three things, persecution, betrayal, hate, but he also gives three encouragement. Like, how do we endure persecution? How do we endure hate and betrayal? Well, there's three things he's going to say. The first is, be wise. He says, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents. So Jesus, a Jew, is speaking to disciples who are Jewish. If you even mention a serpent, what comes to mind? The garden. Genesis 3 comes to mind. They're like, oh, yes, the serpent. He's, he's crafty. He's clever. He's shrewd. So Jesus, you're saying that we need to go out we need to go into the world and we need to be wise. We need to be clever. We need to be shrewd. We need to outsmart sometimes the wolf. Yep, be wise. Next week, I'm gonna tell a story about a missionary, but there's always this tension of like, what is wisdom in the world and what is foolishness in the world? Because sometimes we bring suffering onto ourself by being foolish. And the gospel never calls us to suffer for foolishness, but suffer for wisdom and righteousness sake. I want to give you just a few ways to become wise. If this is the calling, we are to be wise in the midst of the world. How do we become wise people? Well, first is we read the scripture. Pretty important. There's a way that God has designed the world to work. The, 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 there, there are laws that govern not just gravity, but relationships. God is hardwired into creation a certain design to it. And in order to fully appreciate and understand the design of it, we have to understand him and what he has done. And of course, the scriptures are the primary place for the Christian to become wise because we read about who he is, what he has done, who we are, and how we are to live our life. So read the scriptures. Second, seek counsel. Proverbs is full of this idea of the fool tries to do it on his or her own, but the wise person seeks counsel. You know, Jesus knew that these men would come back to him. And they will experience some successes and some failures, and they're going to come back to him. And they're going to be like, Jesus, what do we do about this? He knew that they would come back for his counsel. So as believers, we should also be seeking counsel in every arena of life, especially when we go into the world. Third, ask for wisdom. James is pretty clear in this. He says, hey, if you lack wisdom, ask God for it, and he will give it to you. He has an unlimited supply of wisdom, and so if we lack it, we don't know how to navigate a certain relationship with a certain family member. We don't know how to navigate a relationship in our workplace. We're experiencing hostility. Well, what, what should I do, Lord? Ask him for wisdom. He says he will grant it to you, and then finally hang out with wise people. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. The companion of fool, fools, suffers harm. You and I are really kind of this collection in some ways of the five closest people around us. Those five closest people, they help shape us and form us. And if we're going to be wise people, we want to be shaped and formed by other wise people. So first, Jesus goes, all right, you're going to go into the world. You're going to experience these things. I want you to be wise. Friends, these are ways to become wise. Second, he says, be innocent, right? So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. When you read early church history and you read about some of the, the great martyrs of the faith, those that lost their life because they bore the name Jesus, when you look at why they were killed, it wasn't because they committed some heinous crime. It wasn't because of some kind of bad character. They were martyred and killed because of their faith in Christ. Oftentimes, no allegation could be brought against them. Think about Jesus. What allegation could be brought against him? They had none. 
When the soldier witnessed Jesus die, he said, surely this is an innocent man. Innocent like doves. How we live our life matters. We need wisdom and not just words, but a life that aligns with those words. We're as innocent as doves. So we should be caring. We're, we're not perfect. Please don't misunderstand me. But there's a pattern, a direction to our life. Where we not just speak the truth, but we are the aroma of Christ through how we live our life. And then last, depend on the Spirit. This is his three encouragements. Be wise, be innocent, depend on the Spirit. It says this, verse 19 and 20. When they deliver you over... Do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. So they may have been a little timid. Going, Jesus, you, okay, we're sheep going into the midst of wolves. You're telling us we're going to experience persecution, hate, betrayal. Like, what in the world are we going to say in those moments. And he goes, oh yeah, yeah. Hey, don't worry about that. The spirit that I, I'm going to place inside of you will speak through you in those moments. There's this rid really radical, unique Christian belief that's unlike any other world religion. And it's this, when I place my faith in Jesus, I'm then sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in buildings. The Spirit of God dwells in his people. And if you bear the name of Jesus, you've confessed him as Lord, you believe in your heart that he is Lord over everything. He is your Savior. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. And why? Well, he convicts you of sin. He leads you to truth. And in moments like this, he powerfully speaks and uses you. My, my fear for our generation is this. We're not familiar with the, with the leading of the Holy Spirit, with the voice of God. We have so many other voices that are vying for our attention. So many other things that are trying to lead us that we've neglected how to be people that hear the voice of God, listen to the voice of God, submit to it, and obey him. Because it's in moments like this that if we're truly living a kingdom life, we need him desperately. But friends, that means we have to be familiar with his voice. We have to know when he's leading and guiding. I've shared this before. I had, I had one friend. He's like, man, I, I really want to learn how to submit myself to the Holy Spirit's leading. And so he's like, anytime I get this like poke, this, this like little prod to do something, as long as it aligns with scripture, I just do it. He's like, the other day I, I, I was praying and uh, I sensed the Lord was like, I want you to get down on your knees and pray to me. And he's like, I just did it. I just did it because I, I sensed the Lord wanting me to do this. It was the Holy Spirit leading me. What he was trying to do was cultivate a hearing of the Spirit that is not normal in our culture. And so friends, you and I have to make space we have to become familiar with his voice. And we do that by being still before him, reading his scripture, asking him to guide and lead. And then when he does, we submit to it. And then his voice becomes familiar. So are you experiencing any difficulty because of your faith in Christ? Am I? Let's just ask some questions together. Some questions that I think will really bring home this idea. First, where do I need to take a stand? Where have you been failing both in word and deed to take a stand for your faith? Next, where am I compromising? Are there places in your life that you're compromising, that you're short-circuiting, you're trying to do it your way, not the Lord's way? How about this? Where in my life have I been hiding in fear? If fear is gripping you from speaking and living a kingdom life, come back next week. We're going to talk about fear.
But for many of us, this is what is driving us, not a great love and passion for the king. And maybe the last question is, am I going into the world? See, it would be really easy for us to just surround ourselves in an echo chamber of people who believe exactly the same way we believe. Community is immensely important, but you and I are also called to go into the world, not be of the world, but be in the world. So in our workplaces, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, God has uniquely placed you there for a particular reason, and that is to make his glory and fame known. So are you actually engaging with those people, their loss? We'll end it here. The final encouragement from Jesus, verse 24, he says, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. What he's doing right now is he's pointing them and going, hey, listen up. Something's going to come to pass. And he's pointing us to his betrayal. The hate that will be spewed upon him. The mocking that will occur. And ultimately, his death on the cross. He's going, hey, if if this is what's going to happen to me, you guys should go ahead and set your expectations that if you truly follow me, you too will experience this. He's pointing us to the good news of him. And our hope is not in this life. Our hope is in the one to come. He's the great conqueror and what we celebrate every, every Sunday, but especially last Sunday, his resurrection.